My name is Andreas, sorry, my name is Andreas, and my quest this morning is to um, um, introduce you to um, some more aspects of um, software development for the ARM platform. I'm going to start with um, some uh, easy topics that um, will apply to any one of you that is involved in packaging stuff for OpenSUSE, and then I will gradually go into more advanced topics. So, um, as far as building software packages um, is concerned, um, this is what you should know about the ARM architecture. There is not just the ARM architecture, there is a lot of um, versions and subversions and ABIs um, that we're using for, for different platforms. And the naming slightly varies between um, the different um, software packages involved here. So. Um, the most important um, things to, to know is that we have three ARM architectures supported in OpenSUSE at the moment. If you look at the, the build service, those are called um, ARM v6L, ARM v7L, and ARCH64, with ARCH64 obviously being the 64-bit version, and the other ones being different um, ABIs for 32-bit devices. Um, ARM v6 is uh, mostly for the Raspberry Pi, and ARM v7 is pretty much anything else. Now, if you have um, your home repository or any development repository um, in the build service, then you can add, if you haven't already, um, the OpenSUSE factory ARM um, repository. And once you've done so, then there is, um, by default, only ARM v7 enabled. And you can additionally enable the 64-bit builds. And um, if you really have to, the um, ARM v6 builds. But be aware that, um, as was already indicated on the previous slide, um, ARM v6 is built using emulation. That means it's pretty slow. Whereas um, ARM v7 and, since recently, also um, ARCH64 are built um, on native ARM hardware. Um, for the spec files, the most important bit to know is that um, because there's also been some uh, name changes originally, um, you can use this macro um, represent ARM to represent the two, or in theory even three, 32-bit um, architectures. So that means that you can say, for instance, that a particular um, X driver is only for ARM by saying exclusive arch percent ARM and ARG64 to have it for both 32-bit and 64-bit. Or um, if there's anything particular to 32-bit ARM, like enabling certain options only for that platform, you can use the if watch macro to do that specifically. Now, um, when we're dealing with the um, um, emulated builds, originally that was the 64-bit um, ARM builds, but also, as I mentioned, the ARMv6 build for, um, for the Raspberry Pi. Those are done using QMU, uh, using a user space emulation inside an x86 uh, KVM virtual machine. Um, and sometimes QMU does not get maybe an instruction right or it is lacking you know, some, some new syscall that has come up before. Um, and um, the most frequent uh, way that we're seeing this is that um, test suites um, fail to run maybe because of also some signal handling issues. And if that is the case, it is possible to check this macro um, QMU user space build to see if you're running in such an emulated build and to um, take decisions on that, like um, disabling the um, check phase of the um, RPM package. Obviously, if you do so, um, please don't silently do that everywhere. Just um, do it when necessary. And in that case, also, um, please tell us so that someone can actually look into um, fixing the underlying issues if possible. Another thing to keep in mind is that um, a number of um, larger packages in the build service have started to um, request things like four gigabyte of RAM. When we have build workers for the 32-bit ones that are running uh, mostly on Arndale boards, um, we only have two gigabyte of RAM in hold there, and we're um, you know, taking a part of that for, for the system as well, running the virtual machine. Um, so um, don't take two huge numbers, just take what you really need in order to um, get the package to build 
Oh, and if you've never seen this before, this is like um, a small XML text file that is lying um, inside the, um, the package. In OBS terms, I mean. Now, um, as far as um, getting ARM packages into um, the um, OpenSUSE distribution for ARM, if the package is already in factory, then there's nothing to do. They will simply be rebuilt for ARM. Um, if you have your own um, package that you're currently working on, um, be it an ARM-specific package, like some library that, that doesn't matter elsewhere, or um, some package where you want to um, test that it actually works for ARM2 in addition to the x86 architectures, then you can enable um, the um, ARM builds as described on one of the previous slides in your home repository. Um, and uh, then you're gonna see whether it you know, fails or succeeds as usual. And uh, once you submit them to the develop project, um, some develop projects um, have actually enabled these ARM builds, some don't. Um, where necessary, it might be a good idea to, to actually activate that. I've seen, for instance, that the security repository doesn't have, didn't have ARM builds or not all ARM builds enabled. That may be useful for catching things like uh, libsecomp builds. Um, and um, as probably most of you know, um, when um, the develop project gets submitted to the um, factory repository, open to the factory, then um, it goes through the staging process these days. Um, however, the staging process right now is only done for x86 and for um, PPC64 LE, but not for ARM. That means that um, if um, the package fails to build or fails to build due to other packages, that is not recognized until it actually hits factory and is then built for, um, for ARM. So that's why I was suggesting to um, enable um, ARM builds for, for the respective develop um, repository so that we can catch this um, early on and ideally fix it by the respective contributor. Obviously, um, every rule has exceptions and the exception here is that um, OpenSUSE factory ARM does contain a few packages, uh, most notably the juice package, juice as in just enough OS, that's the um, images that we're using um, rather than ISO installation images for, um, for the regular OpenSUSE. And um, a couple more, like for instance, we're using um, usually a, a newer QMB version for the emulated builds than we have in, in factory. And um, if you have such a ARM specific, ARM factory ARM specific, open source factory ARM specific um, package, um, then the um, submission process will be to directly branch it from open source factory ARM and submit it there directly without going through other developed projects or um, the usual factory process. Now let's get on to kernel development. If um, there is a, a juice image, um, then you can just uh, download an image file, um, un, uh, zip it, exceed, whatever, and write it to an SD card, USB stick, or whatever, and um, power on the device, and it should work. Um, but uh, in many cases, people don't all have the same boards, and new boards come up, uh, come out, you know, like uh, every month at least. Um, so it's um, it's very hard for us to to play catch up, and we rely on um, contributions by um, um, by users of our distribution. And um, in particular, when you compare the uh, architectures that you've seen um, in the first section. Think about that there is not just um, the architectures as defined by the company ARM, but you have like um, two dozen at least vendors that are actually implementing those um, architectures, and each one of those um, needs its specific code to actually boot up. It has um, for, for all you know drivers um, you know, starting from from serial, not even to mention graphics drivers. Um, they're all different between the vendors, and there is no real common subset, in particular for 32-bit. Um, 
um, as far as booting goes. So, you know, for, for x86, you can um, assume that through BIOS or UEFI, you can just um, put a CD into your drive and it will boot up and maybe, you know, sound or network or something is not going to work, but it's going to work in general. Unfortunately, that, that's not um, as easy with ARM these days. Now, um, before you start messing with the kernel, I already mentioned it. There's the, the juice images. Here I've included some... Um, um, some links where you can actually check whether there is something for your board available. There's also a, a probably your first stop resource would be the OpenSUSE Wiki. It's not always um, fully up to date as far as the latest 13.2 um, or factory versions go, but um, if it has a page on a particular device, it means that someone has already started working on it or it might probably even be working, um, so you don't need to start from zero. Um, in some cases, um, it's not possible to put the support for a particular ARM device into um, OpenSUSE factory proper um, because, um, for instance, a proprietary boot firmware might be involved. That's the case for the Raspberry Pi, for instance. Also for most um, Samsung Exynos-based um, chipsets. Um, in those cases, we have the Devel ARM factory contrib plus some name such as, well, Chromebook, Raspberry Pi, whatever, Raspberry Pi 2, um, where you can then find the respective um, packages, including the, um, the images separately from the, the regular ones. Um, now, um, if you don't have a juice image in either of the two um, locations, the question is, would it be very easy to actually add one? So um, is there um, a DTS file in the kernel that we're already packaging, and uh, does the uh, chipset support in terms of drivers already exist for that particular chipset? If that is not the case, well, or, or at least first, if that is the case, then you can just simply branch the juice package, add a few lines to, to an if def, um, generate a new spec file, and you're good. Um, if not, it's gonna be slightly more complicated, more on that later, and um, the second thing to, to ask yourself is how does the boot process work? Um, this is usually um, documented by um, the vendors providing the boards or by community sites documenting those things in some form of wiki like Linux Sun XI, um, Linux Exynos, and Linux Rockchip are some of those um, platforms as well as um, elinux.org. And um, if it's just about enabling the um, correct um, mostly you would binary to build. We have a package that can be branched and also with a script simply um, have a config to that added and then um, be placed at, um, for instance, a particular offset. Um, then that is possible. Otherwise, um, you're going to um, be interested in the, uh, um, the next steps. So if there is uh, no kernel to start from, let's simply assume that um, there is some support for it in the upstream kernel, be it in um, linux.git or linux.nex and linux-nex.git. Um, you can use um, an existing ARM board if you already have one. If not, obviously that's not an, um, uh, an option and you can instead use a chain route using the same QMU emulation technologies that we're using in OBS. Um, there's also um, ice cream um, cross-compiler support um, in, uh, in GCC that you can install. I believe that is even part of a factory. Um, and um, as was outlined on the previous slide, you can't just you know, enable ARM builds for, um, um, for existing packages. You can simply put a tarball for um, a random Linux kernel um, into the build service as well and have it built there if you actually have um, the config for that. Um, if you don't have one yet, you can create it using um, make arch equals arm or arm64 as was outlined on the very first slide and um, running um, old config, mini config, def config, all these commands that you know from, uh, from x86. But there is no universal guide, like I said, this highly varies um, based on um, both board and the chipset the board contains. So you're going to need to rely on documentation provided by the respective vendors. Um, usually, um, the maintainers of the Linux kernel upstream have a diff config for a particular family of chipsets. 
So that's usually the um, recommended way to get started. For instance, there is um, BCM 2835 um, dev config that you can use for, for the Raspberry Pi 1, or there's like an Exynos dev config. Um, for some others, there's just a, um, the, the generic MultiV7 dev config, which covers uh, most of the um, ARMv7 devices in the market. Um, if you want to avoid messing with init RDs, um, simply um, have all the drivers built in. Those mentioned, um, like um, Exynos dev config, will do that automatically by default. And um, for for 32-bit um, builds, um, you can prefer to build a Z image. That Z image can be used um, generically, whereas some old U-boot versions want a um, U-image uh, um, binary, um, which then also has the board or at least chipset specific um, memory location offsets in there. So we can't really build that as a generic um, as a generic uh, kernel package. Um, that's for 32-bit. For 64-bit, um, for it's just called image or image CZ. Once you've uh, compiled the kernel um, via those um, um, outlined ways, um, there is, again, no generic way of how you actually install this um, image to this, uh, this kernel image to the system. And uh, what you need to um, look into in that case is what bootloader is the board using? And uh, where is that bootloader supposed to be located? Um, ideally, it's in a separate flash. And you can use like an SD card or something else or a USB stick, anything else for um, the kernel and the partition that OpenSUSE is providing. Um, for um, UEFI, that's going to be um, the easiest. That's the case with um, most of the 64-bit um, servers that have started to um, emerge. Then you just need to run the grub2 config and have it um, added to the config file, and it'll all work. It should all work. Um, if you're using uBoot, um, then things are a bit more complicated. So um, either you may need to look at the um, environment that is um, located possibly in Flash. There's a printenv command where you can look at the boot arcs and possibly tweak them. Um, otherwise, um, the process that we're using for, for our juice images is to have a file called um, boot scr, which is simply um, a small textual script with um, the commands for loading, um, the um, um, kernel device tree, and so on files from the respective boot medium, usually um, from, from MMC. And um, in case of the Z image, that would be the boot Z command. Otherwise, it's the boot M command for a U, uh, for a U boot image. And um, that script um, gets a small binary header added um, that um, contains the, um, the type of the, um, the data loaded and the, um, the length. That is basically what this boot SCR file is. And you can look at it simply in less um, because of that. And um, another um, alternative bootloader that's come up is the so-called um, LK, little kernel. That's what uh, most um, Android devices use for, for booting these days. Um, that one um, allows you to install the um, Android tools package. And that has a command called fastboot which allows you to transfer via a USB device cable um, a kernel to the device, which it, um, well, to, to RAM on the device, and it will then boot it from, uh, from there. Um, the easiest way is to simply transfer the Z image, that's why it's really handy, or you can create a, um, a boot image, that's what it's called, that's a special Android format that contains both the kernel, the device tree, and the, um, the init RD, plus also the um, the kernel command line. If um, the bootloader, whichever it is, is not located in a separate flash and you need it provided themselves, then um, most, uh, in most cases um, it is going to be an offset very early on the SD card before the real partition start. And um, you're going to need to use um, DD to simply write it there and make sure that your um, partitions uh, don't start that. Once you have that working, 
hopefully, um, the way to actually um, transition to using the official um, OpenSUSE kernel would be to obviously make sure that all the drivers you need um, are in the upstream kernel that OpenSUSE is currently using. Um, so make sure that the um, configs which are um, kept and maintained in the kernel source repository um, actually enable all the, uh, the drivers um, that your board needs. Um, we're, um, for, for OpenSUSE kernel, we're not using built-in drivers for everything, so we need them for, um, for UART, for the serial configs, for, um, for the clocks. Um, but for anything else, pretty much we use uh, modules to make um, the kernel as small as possible while supporting as many devices as possible. Um, so at some point, um, um, an automatic script runs uh, every morning that transfers the um, configs from the, that Git repository into the kernel head package. Then it's going to be rebuilt and um, a couple or even many hours later, we will hopefully have a um, successfully built um, kernel, OpenSUSE kernel. And at some point that gets um, transmitted to, uh, to the kernel stable repository and from kernel stable repository to OpenSUSE factory. And again, once it's in, um, in, in factory, then the ARM flavor will also be uh, get built um, in OpenSUSE factory ARM. An additional thing to watch out is that um, if your board is using a device tree file, um, you need to make sure that the device tree and the kernel are in sync, uh, which means that you need to not only install the kernel package, but also a DTB um, package, which is specific to the respective chipset of your board, which means um, that, uh, for instance, there would be a, a DTB-Tegra 124 package um, to use with the um, Jetson TK1 board as just one random example. And um, depending on what um, ARM chip um, you're using on that particular board, um, is it one that um, supports the um, large um, physical address extensions? Um, we have a kernel LPAE flavor this one is necessary to actually run KVM virtualization. Otherwise, for 64-bit um, servers or for the Raspberry Pi, you can simply use the kernel default flavor. And, well, last but not least, again, if you're using U-Boot, um, the uh, boot SCR file um, does not only need to reference the kernel and the DTB file now, but also the init RD to have all the drivers that are built as modules for the OpenSUSE kernel. And um, you, might make to, uh, you might need to make sure that, you might need to make sure that the, um, um, forgot what I was gonna say, so um, let's just uh, move on. Um, if it's not working, um, then you're gonna need to use um, some uh, Münchhausen methods to, to pull yourself out of that trouble. Um, for instance, um, as far as you can, try not to put things or too much things into the internal flash because um, if the internal flash is somehow screwed, you cannot, can no longer um, easily access them. So um, use SD card initially. If you have an SD card, you can take it out, plug it into your PC via some adapter, and then um, either tweak some links to point to a different kernel and DTB file, or um, um, insert new ones to, to test. Um, before you update the kernel, be it um, installing the, um, the one from, from OpenSUSE, or a new one that you've compiled yourself, always make backups of them. It's very handy. And, um, don't expect everything to work at once. So um, if, you're, um, if you have a serial console working, that's already pretty good um, at times because ARM unfortunately has a lot of regressions from time to time. And um, don't despair. If you don't see an image on HDMI, the device might still be working and you need to be creative to, for instance, use a static IP address connected to the device um, over, over Ethernet and simply um, look at what the device um, has been outputting to the, um, into the kernel log, D message. Um, or um, another trick is if you're using U-Boot, there's a command to actually read memory, so you have a chance of reading the um, in-memory log buff for, um, for the kernel. Um, 
Now, the more difficult part, um, which I can't cover today, is um, if your um, bo board, first, first board is not supported in the kernel, what do you do then? Um, if you have um, usually a, some pre-installed system, um, you can look, for instance, at proc device tree to find out what hardware is wired up in which ways on that. And um, there's um, tools, the, the, the DTC package um, has to, um, options to um, reverse compile the um, binary DTP file into a DTS or other um, ways that you can actually read them. And obviously, um, the Linux kernel usually has multiple, um, um, at least one example per, per chipset that you can look at um, and compare what other boards have and simply use something as a template and play around from there to um, find out. Now I'm going to run very quickly through um, the next topic. Um, in this image, there is um, seven machines hidden that are actually running OpenSUSE on the ARM architecture, and then there's one device with a red circle and that is not running OpenSUSE, but still is an ARM device. That is um, this one over here. It's a board that's often distributed at industry fairs with an um, STM32 chipset, Cortex-M4. And um, I figured out that it is actually possible to use OpenSUSE for developing for those um, MMU-less um, devices not using the same architecture. So here's an example of how you can actually um, compile code for um, a Cortex-M4 device. The limitation to that is that um, you don't have the libgcc um, available for that particular sub-architecture. Um, so you might run into, um, in particular, linker errors if you're compiling your own um, firmware code. Um, but um, both the kernel and uBoot have a private copy of the, the relevant libgcc files that you can simply um, activate, um, enable to, um, to build them instead of that uh, one. Um, you will need to have some information from the reference manuals about that hardware, um, in particular as far as memory goes. So um, when you're um, using um, OpenSUSE on, on some Intel notebook, then um, you're used to having gigabytes of memory. Um, if we're talking about, in particular, the bootloader, that does not have that many uh, memory um, available from the start. Um, so um, you might have, you know, like um, a megabyte, four megabytes, something in that magnitude available. And um, the, um, um, the different areas where memory is available need to describe separately in the linker script. And the usual setup is that you have an initial bootloader that runs in the SRAM. And then that bootloader copies um, code from, um, from, from the flash memory or other um, storage medium into the um, SD RAM or whatever um, other RAM is available on uh, the board and um, um, jumps into, into the kernel um, in, uh, in memory there. In order to save memory, because that is usually very limited on these boards, um, it is possible to use the execute in place mode of the kernel. So that means that you can um, execute parts of the kernel from um, your flash memory and only have the ones where data is actually changing in, uh, in uh, the RAM. So this is the example that I um, already held up. And another example that I'm currently working on is um, an FM4 board, this one over here. The difference is that for, um, for that STM board, people have already created the um, relevant configs and driver support um, in order to flash it from our open source distribution via tool. And here I'm still working on uh, the flash driver. Now, if things have gone really wrong, be it with microcontrollers or with um, servers or other boards, um, there's a way to actually um, get things into um, a, a working state again. So many boards have connectors like, like these. There is even many more variations of these. Um, JTEC stands for Joint Test Action Group and is a standard of how you can interface with um, chips or flash chips um, on, the, um, on boards. 
Um, there's also some USB-based standards, so um, the CNSS DAP that you're seeing down here is pretty much what the embed boards are using that um, Andrew is going to talk about in the afternoon. And um, before um, I put up the slide about the software, um, remember this is really about hardware, so this is not all binary. It means that um, some of those pins might be uh, 1.8 um, volt, others might be 3.3, 5 volt, or whatever. So um, not all adapters can work with all voltages. Beware of that. There might be you know, garbage and being read if, if they don't match. And um, just because it looks the same doesn't mean that it actually is the same. So there's like uh, Silings and, and Mary are using the same um, pinout, but like a mirror image of, of the actual um, usage of the pins. And that can vary as well. And um, one handy thing to know is that um, when you're not feeling like actually wiring the, uh, the particular um, uh, wires yourself from, from one adapter to, to the actual board, um, there's lots of adapters like these. So this is the 20-pin configuration going from, this, um, from the half-size inch to the full-size inch variation of one size. Um, or from, uh, this is uh, one um, USB interface adapter. They don't have to be really huge. So. Um, you can go from um, about um, 50 euro to like um, probably 4,000 if you go for Lauderbach. Um, so um, the uh, the software, if we're not um, thinking about those those professional devices um, of choice, would be Open OCD. That's been gaining a lot of traction lately. We have the um, 080 package new in 13.2. Um, 090RC1 was submitted shortly before the, um, the conference. I've seen some warning and error messages actually flashing the, uh, this board again, but it's actually still working. So if anyone um, has such adapters, please try it out and report any regressions you have. Um, it is possible to add support for new um, boards at runtime as a simple um, script file, text file, um, using TCL. And as far as um, new um, USB adapters go, if it's not FTDI chip based, um, then it needs um, a, a driver written in C, same for internal flash memories um, used on the chip. I believe I'm pretty much over time, so um, any questions I think we'll have to delay to outside of this room. Thank you much for, um, for, for your attention, and if you want to, um, Get in touch with the people working on ARM. These are the IRC channel and the mailing list dedicated to these um, efforts and um, the, the portal from which you can um, dive into the ARM wiki. Thank you.